All right, I'm sold. At this point, you love discriminants. They can do so much. They're not just for quadratics. They measure, in an aggregate sense, how spaced apart the roots of a polynomial equation are. When they're zero, they tell you that your polynomial has repeated roots. When they're irrational, they tell you that your polynomial has an irrational root. When they're not real, your polynomial has to have a non-real root. How awesome is this? And it's not just for quadratics, and it's so much more than b squared minus 4ac. Where do I sign up? Well, I've got some bad news. It turns out that discriminants are maybe not quite so cool as you think they are, at least at a first glance. Because after all, your high school teacher knew the discriminant of a polynomial, a quadratic, just by doing b squared minus 4ac. But as far as we can tell, we have to know the roots of the polynomial before we know the discriminant. That seems like a cheat. Right. So is it really as great as I'm making it out to be? The bad news is, not only is it not easy to compute on a first glance, it also has a bigger problem of not really being well defined. So we'll get that bad news. But the good news is that even though the discriminant is not well defined, its square is well defined, which is great. The better news is that the square of the discriminant is not only well defined, it's always a rational number, which is awesome. But the best news of all is that even though the discriminant is defined in terms of differences, products of differences of roots, we won't need to know the roots to find the discriminant. We can do a similar b squared minus 4ac thing with other polynomials just using their coefficients to find the discriminant without knowing the roots. And that's awesome. That's the best news of all. So let's get going. First comes the bad news. The discriminant of a polynomial is not a well-defined quantity. Scumbag, lying discriminant. It looked like such a great thing, but then it turns out that it's not even single-valued. In other words, you and I might compute the discriminant for a polynomial and get different answers for the same polynomial. How is that possible? Well, if you are watching the first part of these videos carefully, you'll notice that I made a choice when I computed those discriminants. I chose which of the roots was x1, which one was x2, which one was x3, and so forth. So here's a polynomial on this slide with four roots, a quartic, negative 1, 2, negative 3, and 4. And before I compute the discriminant, I have to decide how to order those roots, which one is first, which one is second, and so on. And that choice matters. If we choose to order the roots differently, we might compute a different discriminant. Let's verify that in as brutal a fashion as possible for this quartic. If I order those four roots just as shown, negative 1, 2, negative 3, and 4, I compute a value of 2100 for the discriminant. Great. I could pick a different ordering and also get 2100, and then another different ordering and get 2100, and so on, and so on. There are a lot of different ways to order these four roots. And all the ones shown here on the left, all 12 of these possible orderings, give us the same answer. They all seem to agree that the discriminant of this polynomial is 2100. Great. But of course, I wouldn't be doing this example unless there were some orderings that disagree. So this ordering, 2, negative 1, negative 3, 4, comes out with a discriminant of negative 2100. So this one doesn't agree with the others. And neither do these 11 either. So we've got this big tug of war here. We have 12 different orderings of the roots of this polynomial that give us 2100, and another 12 orderings of the same roots that give us negative 2100. So of course, a student of algebra will ask, which is it? Is the discriminant of this polynomial positive 2100 or negative 2100? If this shows up on a test, which of these numbers should I write so that you give me full credit? And like any good teacher that gets asked a question like that, we avoid it. So here's how we're going to avoid it. We avoid the question by never thinking of the value of the discriminant in a vacuum, in isolation. We don't care whether the discriminant is 2100 or negative 2100. It's not either one of those. Somehow, it's both. But that's not very satisfying. We would like for our discriminant-like object to have a single value that we can all agree upon. So what we do Between these two is values we by instead of thinking of the discriminant, let's think of the square of the discriminant. Let's just square everything we see. If we square everything we see, then both the orderings on the left and the orderings on the right agree on the number 4,410,000. Even if we can't agree whether the discriminant itself was positive or negative, we can all agree that its square 
is the same number. Good, so that's progress. The next step in that progress is that not only is the square always a single value, the square is always a rational number for polynomials with rational coefficients. This is big news, because not only does the square agree on a value, that value is nice, that value is rational. Here's a quartic whose five coefficients are all rational numbers, but its roots are definitely not. This has two irrational roots and two non-real roots. What's its discriminant? If we multiply the pairwise differences of its roots, we come out with a number 4,010 times radical negative 10. Not rational, not even real, so not that great, right? But that's to be expected. After all, this polynomial has irrational and non-real roots. So it's not surprising that it's discriminant. It is not rational and not real. But what happens if we square it? If I square that discriminant, I come up with a number negative 160,801,000. It's a gigantic number, but it's a gigantic rational number, which is awesome and is impressive. The reason it's so impressive is how did we get the discriminant? We multiplied the differences of these roots, and all these roots have wacky, irrational, and non-real things going on in them. So after all of the dust settles, it's too much, seemingly, to expect that the square of that number will be a rational number. But it turns out to be the case, and it's always the case, which is something we have to prove. But here's the best news of all. As advertised, just as your high school teacher could know the discriminant of a quadratic without solving it for its roots, we're going to be able to do the same. So let's take the quadratic in a simple case and look at what that means. So your high school teacher says that the discriminant of t squared minus 4t plus 1 is b squared minus 4ac, which is 12. We say that the discriminant of that quadratic is 2 radical 3. So how could we know our discriminant without knowing those roots? In other words, how could we have gotten 2 radical 3 without having to solve uh, using the quadratic formula first? Well, your Algebra 1 teacher knew how to find the discriminant of a quadratic using just the coefficients, b squared minus 4ac, that's all that she needed to find the discriminant to be 12. So what about us? Where did our 2 radical 3 come from? Could it have come just from the coefficients? Of course. After all, if we square our 2 radical 3, suddenly we agree with your high school teacher. So in other words, what your high school teacher told you was the discriminant was really the square of what we think of as the discriminant. And once we realize that, we're in agreement with one another, which is great. So the theorem is that any quadratic polynomial, at squared plus bt plus c, the square of its discriminant, in our sense of the word discriminant, is b squared minus 4ac. Well, almost. So here's where your high school teacher told you a little white lie. And that is, if the coefficient, the leading coefficient of this quadratic is not 0, then we also need to divide by a squared here. So the actual square of the discriminant in our sense of a quadratic is b squared minus 4ac all divided by a squared. So your algebra teacher lied a little bit, but they were almost right. If you divide by a squared, we become in agreement. And for this polynomial, because a was equal to 1, we just happen to already agree. And here's the proof of that formula. If we believe that the quadratic formula is true, then we know exactly what the two roots of this quadratic are going to be. So all we have to do to find the discriminant is just subtract the second from the first. But notice that they have minus b over 2a in common, which is going to go away when we subtract. And the other piece, those are equal and opposite, so that when we subtract them, they combine. So when I subtract, I end up getting twice b squared minus 4ac radical over 2a. Add those together, we get radical b squared minus 4ac over a. But then, what we were saying before, because the ordering matters, because it matters which is x1 and which is x2, that's going to introduce a negative sign if we flip-flop them. So really, there's a plus or minus here, which should also look familiar from the quadratic formula. But we resolve the issue again by squaring that difference away. And when we square that difference away, we end up with that discriminant squared to be b squared minus 4ac, all divided by a squared. And here's the bestest, bestest news, is that not only do these results that we showed here work for quadratics, and not only do they work 
for polynomials with rational coefficients. They work for polynomials with coefficients in any field, no matter what. So here's what I call the discriminant theorem. If f is any field at all, and p is a polynomial of degree n over that field, then if I square that discriminant, I'm going to get something which belongs to the original field of coefficients. So the results that we had before, that the square of the discriminant was single valued and that it was rational, that holds not just for rational coefficients. It holds for coefficients in any field. So this is surprising, because the roots of a polynomial whose coefficients are in f don't have to be in f. In general, they're not. They're in a much larger field that we call the algebraic closure of f. So the roots of this polynomial might lie in a much, much bigger field. But there's something special about the discriminant that when I combine the roots in just that way, by subtracting them pairwise, multiplying them together, and then squaring the result, that that unholy combination of roots will have its value back in the original field. Even if the roots themselves were crazy and off the wall, this combination of them lands back in the original field. And just to verify that with the examples that we saw earlier in this video, here they are. Notice that whether the roots were all rational, as they were in the first example, that discriminant squared ended up being 0, which is rational. When, both of the, when all three of the roots were, well, a couple of them were not rational, there was the 1 plus minus radical 10 example, there the square of the discriminant ends up being 81, which is, again, a rational number. And in our last example, where we had two non-real roots, when you square its discriminant, we get a number 43,681 which is rational. So talk about a versatile tool. The discriminant not only is just some weird combination of products of differences of the roots of a polynomial, but it has this magical property that when you square the discriminant of any polynomial, that value, even if the roots were crazy, lies back in the original coefficient field. So any polynomial with rational coefficients even if its roots are crazy complex numbers, subtract them pairwise, multiply them together, and square, and you get something which is rational again. And no matter where your polynomial begins, whatever field its coefficients belong to, even if its roots belong to something much, much different, when we subtract them pairwise, multiply them together, and square the result, when we get the square discriminant, that lies back in the original field of coefficients. This result will be a little bit less surprising once we understand more about how the symmetric group acts on groups of polynomials. But that's a topic for a little bit later on down the line. For now, stand in awe at the value, both emotionally and practically, of using discriminants to qualify the nature and number of solutions of polynomial equations.